All right. Well, hello again, everybody. Uh, I'm Rich Eisen, and you are at the Open Mic, where I, on a fairly regular basis, not as regular as uh, as in the past, uh, it seems like of late, but uh, where I regularly talk to writers, agents, editors, and other folks from the publishing industry. And uh, today, I'm, I'm really thrilled. I'm, I'm joined by uh, we all heard of the triple threat in the entertainment, singer, dancer, actress. And, and, but in our world, we have editor, agent, writer, Elizabeth Liz Crock. How are you doing today, Liz? Great, great. How are you? Oh, man, I'm fabulous. Uh, I'm going to apologize to anybody right up front. If you hear a, a strange squeaking noise off in the background, um, I am on puppy wrangling duty today. She's probably going to go to sleep, but she's got her little, her little squeezy toy. So if you hear it, uh, it's not me. I promise it's her. So, um, <clears throat> well, Liz, it's, it's great to see you. I, 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 I'm, I really am excited to talk to you today because you are so well-versed in so many areas of the publishing industry. Um, but I want to start out first talking about your writing. And um, for those who don't know, Liz is the author of The Author's Checklist, an agent's guide to developing and editing your manuscript right here. And if you haven't got this book yet and you're an aspiring author, let me just say, uh, what are you waiting for? Because this is a great book. There are so many craft books out there and so many of them focus just on the art and craft of writing. And that's great. Those are really valuable. But um, this is one of the first ones I've seen where it just really helps you tie up those things at the end and make sure you've asked yourself every question that needs to be asked and that it's incredibly valuable. So tell me about the book before I blather on about it and, you know, uh, and what aspiring authors can expect to see uh, when they, when they read this book. Well, um, the book was sort of born of um, a number of years of just realizing I was giving out the same advice to writers and so, you know, I, I had always wanted to be a writer myself, but, you know, when I was younger, I, I realized, well, what do I have to say? You know, I don't have, I don't know what I have to say, but as I kind of like began in the publishing industry, which started in newspaper, um, I just realized it was a really good fit for me career wise. And so when I became an agent, um, you know, I still had these sympathies for writers because I know, you know, how hard it is. And I'd, I'd been on the other side of it, kind of working on book proposals and things like that. Um, but when I became an agent and I started to get submissions, I started to see just how big of a gap there was between what we feel is ready and what an, an author feels uh, is, you know, might be ready. And there's a reason that, you know, we get a lot of submissions that aren't quite where they need to be because it's very hard to get feedback, right? But, um, uh, uh, you know, as the years went on, I just started noticing that I kept giving the same advice. And as I started to do freelance editorial work, I noticed that I was, you know, giving the same advice, on, you know, to those um, writers as well. And so at some point, I think we might have had like a slow, I might have had a slow period in my income or something. And I was like, you know what, I better, let me, let me just take a look at this book while I'm, you know, while I'm not doing much. And um and I realized I sort of collected a lot of pieces of advice. And so I, I just started working on that, you know, started working on uh, looking back through all the editorial letters I'd written and all the advice that I know I've given to writers about dialogue or characterization. And I just started, um, you know, really focusing on like, how would I structure the book? Um, you know, looking at the easiest way for people to access the information and, um, and, you know, so how to structure it and what might be missing. And then I, and then I just sort of launched off. Um, I, I did something bad. Well, I, you know, I would consider it bad. I, I only sent it out to one editor. I didn't even really kind of launch it out there in a big way. Like most writers would, like I would suggest most writers that I just sent it to one person. And about four months later, she got back to me and she said, is this still available? I like this concept. And we'd like you to add 15,000 more words or something like that. Can you do that? And so then it went, so then I really went through the process of, uh, you know, structuring and figuring it out. But um, basically that was kind of what started. It was just noticing that I was giving the same advice to people over and over and over again, and that I should collect it all. And then, and then it would be a cheap way for people to, to kind of realize, okay, these are all the things that other writers are having trouble with. And if I can know this ahead of time, or if I can kind of look through this book before I submit 
it, it might bring me about two drafts closer to being ready for an agent. And usually agents, um, usually agents are looking for projects where they're only going to have to go through it once, maybe to, to go with, go through one more um, editorial round with them before they send it out. Sometimes if you're a newer agent in the, in the industry, younger, you know, in the industry, you might, you might go through a book three times, but as you start to collect clients and you get busier and busier, you know, it becomes uh, difficult to be able to, to go through something so many times. So you're hoping for things that are, you know, later in your career, you're hoping for things that are, you know, really ready to go. And so that's kind of what the, that's the idea behind the book is to get writers closer. Is that like my empathy for them is like, okay, here's a way that, you know, that you're going to be able to get a little closer, I think. Well, and you know, I, I've, I, I've heard you say before, and, and I think I saw it again, maybe in the book, uh, that most manuscripts are about four revisions away from being actual, actually ready to have agents start uh, looking at them. Uh, what's the, is, is that the biggest mistake that a newbie writer makes? Or are there others? I mean, because I think most writers are, would be shocked. And, you know, and I, I, again, I know this from personal experience. You, you finish <clears throat> and you polish it a little bit and you think it's ready. But what you're saying is, okay, that's really not true. You you might be three or four or more away from that. Do you find that to be the most consistent mistake writers make? Or is there is there something else that writers uh, often, that, that might be in, in your book here that, that help them uh, before they go out and start pitching agents uh, before they're ready? Right. I think that it's just that it's really hard to have that objectivity as a writer. Um, even for me with my own work, you know, I sent something out that I had to a couple people and they're like, oh, it takes so long to get going. It takes seven pages. And I'm like, that's not that long. But then when I'm on the other side of it, I'm like, this is taking too long to get going. We need that in the first two paragraphs, you know? And so um, I think what, what happens with the four drafts you know, people not being ready is sometimes people are getting copy edits done on their work before they're instead of a developmental edit and that very different kind of editorial um, process. And so the writing might be technically good, but then as you kind of go along, you're starting to find that certain threads are not explored that have been opened up that that get left off. Uh, always reminds me of like the Winchester Mystery House in San Jose, where they have all these stairways that go nowhere. And so it's kind of like that in, in projects, too, that there are, are, you know, threads that get opened up and there's a lot of potential for those threads, but then they never get explored or they drop off. And um, and or you get to the end of the manuscript and you just realize, OK, like one example uh, that I have is there's a woman that I'm going to probably work with freelance that has a really long timeline and um, and really what I'm going to suggest to her is to shorten it from like 10 to 15 years to one year so that it puts pressure and tension on the characters and, and, and gives us a sense that there, there's a lot more happening because in her case, uh, or the outline that she kind of sent me showed me that there was a lot of downtime and, um, and it just wasn't going to work for the, for the manuscript. Um, so so I think what what a lot of times writers need is a, a really objective look at their whole project, whereas somebody's looking at every aspect. Because what I'm finding is that there are so many big changes that need to be made, and so like there's usually one big major revision, and then as you as you go back through the next time and the time after that, it's fine tuning. You know, it's mm -hmm. really it, you get to the point where there's so little, maybe just line edits as you go, little line edits at the very end, or maybe character something about the character is not reading right. Things that are easier fixes than big major changes where you're combining chapters or you're moving chapters around, you're moving something from the back forward or vice versa. So, um, so that's kind of, you know, how that goes. So I think, I mean, there are a lot of mistakes that writers make when they approach agents and editors, but, um, but one is, you know, basically not quite being ready, but I also understand why that is because very hard to get the feedback you need to, to be ready. So, right. well, and, and you mentioned something that I really wanted to follow up on, which is, you, you know, you've been an agent for a long time. I should mention that Kimberly Cameron and Associates, very, you know, highly respected agency. Um, how was it for you to be on this side of the equation? Uh, did you learn anything as a writer 
on this side of the equation that will impact maybe how you interact with writers and publishers going forward? It was, I learned a lot. I mean, I, I, I found myself being like a stubborn kid on the other side of it. Cause I, you know, I had a, a very, very highly intelligent, highly educated copy editor on my book and she just ripped it apart. And, um, it took me probably when I got my copy edits back, it took me about two weeks to even look at them. And therefore I kind of went beyond my deadline. So I had to ask for another week because I just, it was just like, you, you know, and this happens to writers, you know, you go through, so you go through it so many times and then you get a, a big edit like that back and it's just overwhelming, you know? And so, so I have newfound respect. I know how that is. Um, and, you know, of course, everything that she, you know, my, my editor on the book, um, Georgia Hughes said, she goes, you know, she goes, it is your book. So you get to decide if you want to accept these copy edits, but she said, but she said, I think most of them are pretty good suggestions. And it was a lot. Um, and I really got, I got stretched, you know, and the book is much better for it. Um, because I had to go back and do more research in the things that I was saying and, and bringing up. And I realized that there was a, on one end of the book, it's, it felt like I had focused so much on the beginning, which I do see with writers writing fiction. They focus so much on this beginning because the beginning is so important, right? To get through to the agent or through to the editor, but then the other half of the book suffers for it because all this time and attention has been spent there. So at one point when I went back through edits, I decided to start in the middle and work to the end so that I was giving more attention to the end because that's where I could feel that things kind of dropped off in, in just how I approached you know, some of the sections. I, I probably could have done more, but then there, there was a point at which we kind of ran up against the, the time for the book to be in and it's like, okay, no more big copy edits because I, I did some pretty significant rewrites during that process. So I think that probably tortured the copy editor too. But um, so I think just in general, um, you know, just really knowing how hard the process is and really you just have to get used to revising and revising and revising. Um, and probably in my approach again, you know, like I would approach in a broader way, like with my next book, I'll probably make sure that I, I don't send it out just to one person, you know, like I'll, I'll give myself more of an opportunity. Um, you know, and I see that a lot with writers that submit to me, they, they submit to one or two people and then they decide to self publish, which can kind of, you know, sometimes get in the way of their career if they're not too careful. So I think, you know, I've got to take my own advice, <laughs> you know, right. so. Well, and, and along those lines, um, what do you look for in a submission? I'm going to ask you now, we're going to take you back to putting on your agent hat again. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what do you look for in a submission? And by that, I mean, is there something that stands out for you in a quality submission that gets your attention? Uh, is it really good writing? Is it more often concept? Is it uh, in a nonfiction thing, which is clearly very different from fiction, uh, is it the, the platform? You know, what are the things that stand out for you when you get a submission and say, okay, I want to give this a little more attention? Mm -hmm. Um, usually it's, uh, you, well, it's a, it's a number of things, but usually it might start with a query letter where you get a query letter that's just very straightforward. There's no gimmicks. Um, there's no, there's nothing standing out either underestimating the writer, underestimating themselves or overestimating themselves. So that'll be the first thing when the query comes in, if it's really straightforward, business-like and has most of the pieces that we look for that, that sometimes stands out because we get so many crazy, you know, uh, query letters. In fact, I was just for something I'm working on for grad school, I was looking through my, my bad query letters file and there's some doozies in there, you know, just like you just, you know, how somebody thinks that they could actually begin a, a working relationship with some of the queries that we receive is just, you know, it's, it's crazy. But so that would be the first thing. Um, we're pretty lenient at our agency. So even if the query letters aren't like, you know, amazing, you know, we tend to look at the submission to crack that open because sometimes there is a real disparity and you see, you know, this is a technical piece of writing. So some writers aren't great at it. Then you open the submission and the writing's amazing, you know, so that, that can happen and you can miss out as an agent. If you, you know, if you're, you're looking to reject somebody based on a one typo or, or something that you don't like about their query letter. So, um, so that's another thing, uh, the great writing will really pull us in, 
but it's not just great writing because as you begin to read those first 10 pages, our mind starts to tick off a number of things such as like, do I know where I am in time and place? You know, is the setting developed really early on? Do I know where I am? Do I know, is this historical? Is this contemporary? Then, you know, we're looking at this, the, the main character that's being introduced right away. Do I feel sympathy for this character? Am I pulled in, you know, by this character? Do I want to go on the journey with this character? What, you know, what's at stake? Uh, and so we're looking at that. Um, the writing, of course, is important. We can know probably in, in just, you know, a few paragraphs, whether the writing is where it needs to be. Um, sometimes writing is just sort of it's commercial, you know, so it's not necessarily, you know, edging on the literary side. So it's more commercial and it gets the job done and that's OK. But you have to be pulled in by the um, by the characters in the story itself. And then we're looking for that inciting incident. Is that occurring in these first early pages? Do we know what's setting the character off and the story off? So. So there's a number of things we're looking at, you know, in those first uh, 15 pages, that first chapter of any book. Um, and even for nonfiction, I would be looking at nonfiction, uh, not necessarily memoir. Memoir would be treated a little bit more like fiction, right? But then other nonfiction, you're looking at the formatting and the structure and the concept that's being presented and how well it's being executed. Some agents are a little bit more willing to work with somebody on their nonfiction proposal development. Um, so sometimes those can come in a little shaky or undeveloped, but, you know, um, with some help, they can, you know, kind of be developed to, to uh, be more full. But yeah, that's, that's basically it. It's, you know, the writing, but there's a lot of other things as well. Well, and, you know, this is, <clears throat> this is really good information for, uh, I think, aspiring writers to have, because I think, you know, when you're a writer, and, and clearly, you know, this, I mean, you get so invested in this thing that you, this is, you're, you're birthing this and creating this, even if it's nonfiction and, and you forget sometimes how many business considerations are going to be attached on the other end and, and thinking even those little things, the setting in place and how does, how does all of that help you as an agent put this product out there to be sold as a commodity and to try to get the widest audience possible. It's so hard for a writer because you're just so invested in this thing. And <clears throat> so this is all really good stuff for people to hear. So they understand a little bit more about what you as an agent are seeing. You're not seeing the same thing that they're seeing initially. And it takes a while, I think, for it all to get there. Um, I, you know, I wanted to touch on this last year and a half because, you know, COVID has been one. This has, of course, been in our lifetimes. None of us have has experienced anything like this in our lifetimes. How has the pandemic affected uh, you first as a writer? I'll ask you that first as a writer, <clears throat> because I know a lot of folks did. It really did impact them when they had books that were scheduled to come out or appearances to be made or what have you. Um, I'll ask you later next about it as an agent, but let, let me ask you first about it as a writer. How did, how did the pandemic impact you in that way? Um, well, my book came out. I was one of the poor, unfortunate souls that, whose book came out um, in 2020. So um, it came out just before. I mean, it, my brother was warning me about the pandemic because somehow he knew, he really knew about it since December, you know, before of the year uh, 19 uh, or 2019, sorry. <laughs> where am I? Um, so he was kind of warning me about, you know, these things. And right around the time that my book come out, he's like, you got to start going shopping and gathering things, you know, remember that whole like scare right. around the grocery store stuff. And um, so when my book came out, it was sort of, yeah, everything got canceled. All my book events, I probably had five or six scheduled and all of them got canceled. And um and I, th I think for me as a person, like I felt this enormous sense of relief of like suddenly being not because publishing and, and our inbox is just a constant and it's just a lot of pressure all the time. Even if, even if I don't have deadlines, I feel like I've got all these people that are waiting to hear from me and I feel bad that I'm never getting back to them and that sort of thing. So, so there's always a lot of pressure, but some, some, for some reason that when the pandemic happened, everybody 
you know, everybody was had the pandemic issues, but they also everybody seemed to have a lot of personal things come up. So everybody disappeared. And it I felt this real sense of like quiet that I needed really badly. You know, things just slowed down and everybody was going through so much and nobody was expecting anything of anybody, which was exactly kind of what I needed. And my boss was just like, just focus on yourselves, you know, just take care of yourselves, which was, you know, really amazing. And um and so, so I had all my events canceled and then, you know, uh, subsequently, and I think we've talked about this, I started getting strange migraines and that really threw off my world for quite a while. Um, because I, because they're the ocular migraines, which are really tricky to deal yeah. with. And so I, so I, I basically took that summer to kind of regroup and, uh, I went and decided to take a move down to where the parents were and um, my sister and we kind of bubbled together and um, and just kind of made sure that the, you know, the parents didn't have to go out much and get, you know, groceries and things like that. So it, it big shift in my life. But I mean, the you know, unfortunately for my book, it really, you know, basically everything just sort of stopped. And once we all started to get happening with zoom um then i was able to start doing more events and uh you know do things to kind of stimulate you know sales or whatever but i think it didn't perform as the the publishers had hoped just because we got stopped right in the right in the beginning yeah that, that i yeah i'm sure a lot of writers have that exact same story yeah a couple of my clients did too yeah well how about as an agent and Specifically because, you know, agents get so many of their new clients through conferences, which of course all got canceled. Some went to virtual and it's not the same thing though, because as, you know, our, our mutual friend, Jim Latoile, you know, you guys met uh, looking at books around a table at a conference, you know, and it is, I think almost every writer I know, that's actually how they get their agents. They have an opportunity to meet them face-to-face -face and talk some, more often than not about things other than books. And you get an idea if you even want to talk with this person and that kind of thing. Right. Uh, so how how was it for you as an agent uh, with that whole process during COVID? I guess, um, you know, in some ways it's, it allowed me to sort of get to get a breather and to get to work through some things rather than, um, you know, a lot of times you have all these events and then they they also get you behind in your work. Um I don't know. I've found the virtual conferences kind of nice because you're even closer to people. You see their bookcases, you see the their the things, you see their pets, and I like that. I like it personalizes things for me. So I actually like the virtual um, experience um, more than I thought I would. And um, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's it disrupted that. I would say it's a little bit harder to sell books as well. In the industry, everybody you know, even my New York agent friends are, you know, they're just like, it's really hard in the industry right now to sell books. Um, and I think, you know, there was a lot of shifting that went on in, in publishing houses where they had to uh, suddenly change their royalty system to virtual, you know, or digital. So people weren't sending out royalty statements anymore. So there were a lot of shifts that occurred and people were not sure if they're going to lose their jobs. You know, a lot of editor, all of course, editors were working from home. So we had we got some opportunities um, to to meet with editors um, more than usual. Or they they everybody seemed to be like at their desk and working and you know, but doing it from home. And and um, so I don't know. There were some unusual kind of opportunities, but I think also it's it's just been, become very difficult to sell uh, books right now. Um, and I'm trying to think of anything else that that kind of stands out. Well, let me let me add a question to that. And I've asked this question before, but I've never asked it post COVID of anybody because the industry has changed a lot over the last couple of decades anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, Self-publishing used to be viewed a particular way. And now, you know, it's it's become much more mainstream. We've seen the publishing houses go from you know this many down to this many <clears throat> everything it feels like has changed Did, you know the, the amazon has changed everything um since you've been on so many sides of these issues now do you think things are better for writers now than they were maybe even just 10 years ago um are they not as good um has covid changed 
things to a point where, you know, it's maybe that next huge evolution instead of small incremental things where it's a, such a, the changes are so big that we're, we don't even know yet what it's going to look like. I mean, what's your sense of the, of the industry now as, as it is for writers for, for, for who are trying to start out? I guess it, you know, like that's a tough question. I mean, I guess in some ways, I think, um, I think, you know, writers have more opportunities than they've had in the past. They have more, they probably have more, um, gosh, what's the word I'm looking for? More bargaining power in some ways. Um, I, you know, the industry is interesting because it does experience a lot of change. I'm not sure. I'm not sure kind of on the inside what those changes look like, you know, during or post COVID from the publishing house perspective. Um, but, you know, certainly in 2009, when eBooks kind of came onto the scene and everyone was like, are we going to, you know, or, or is everything going to go to eBook now? Is, there, is everybody going to shift? I think we eventually saw that, no, you know, it didn't, it didn't totally shift in that direction. I think we still sell more uh, print books. Um, so, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to say I'm not the best future forecaster, but I do, one thing that I do notice is that I, I feel like with self-publishing, the, the, the difficulty with self-publishing is being found, right, as a writer. So when you self-publish, and if you're self-publishing just on Amazon or, um, or with a small publisher, oftentimes the problem is the distribution, that your book uh, doesn't get out doesn't circulate in the way that it needs to in order to be found by readers. And so what happens is a lot of people self-publish and they only sell, you know, a thousand or 500 or 200 books. And then, you know, what I see in the industry still is people will come to me at conferences, even virtual ones, and they'll say, well, I published this book, but you know, now I'm not really selling any copies because I'm not a good marketer. I'm not a good publicist, like I'm not good at publicity or marketing. And unfortunately, the industry still looks at you as though, you know, you've published your book, right? You've got an ISBN number, you've published your book, and they can look up your sales and see that you aren't, you aren't selling any books or that you haven't sold any books. And so, and it's really not that different from what somebody who goes with an indie publisher experiences, who, who actually gets the opportunity, has distribution, um, you know, some of those more mid-sized publishers, but still doesn't sell enough books because the, the, the larger publishers want to see the numbers and they're like, well, how many did he sell? I, you know, how many books did he sell? He didn't sell more than 4,000 books. Well, it's not enough for us to take a look at the project. So, and sometimes before we weren't getting that kind of information where they were just outright saying, well, how many books did his last series sell? You know, they would still take a look or they would say they would take a look, Right. But now we're getting feedback that some some you know editors won't even take a look if that if their previous book hasn't sold, and so that's a little bit for me the the tricky part of um, self publishing. Even though it's a great opportunity for writers, um, in in a lot of ways, um, if you have these traditional dreams, um, it's it can make it those those traditional uh, publishing dreams a little bit more difficult if you just put it out there and it doesn't sell. And so, you know, I was thinking about that this morning because one of my authors who isn't, he's no longer my author, but I noticed that he got a royalty check that came in and I was like, I was like, okay, he's making some money. And it made me think about the fact that he has continued to put books out. And there is, there, there was something I read not that long ago that if you just keep putting books out, eventually you're going to start, it's going to generate, you know, uh, sales and it's going it, to, like, it's somehow it's going to create and generate you know, interest in your book in some ways. And I don't know if that's an algorithm thing, or I can't remember what the article said, but I kind of thought about that this morning when I saw that royalty check. And I was like, maybe it's good that he put these out through an indie publisher, you know? And so I think that that's the kind of thing, like, I'm not really sure. I don't know a hundred percent, but I know, I do know that if you kind of suddenly, if you do have dreams of being with the big five, it can, it can, get in your way if you put something out without enough thought, you know, and myself included, right? I put this book out and I don't know what my sales are. I've probably only sold maybe a few thousand or maybe a little bit less than that. Um, but that might hurt me in the, in the end, if I try and, you know, take something out to a big publisher, they may be like, well, you know, you didn't sell enough copies of that other book. So, 
you know, my other book is going to be completely different. It's not going to be a technical writing book, but, um, but that, you know, I just don't know exactly how they make their decisions, you know? So. Well, and, and, you know, I think all of that is stuff again, writers, <laughs> you know, that's why all these things, I, I, I think this is probably why you as an agent have experienced the franticness of writers all the time. And I think it's because so many, you know, I'll backtrack. One of the things when I talk to, to my fellow writers, aspiring writers, and then, uh, the one thing I feel like I've learned in this business, <clears throat> if I've learned anything at all, the only thing I feel like I've learned in this business is know what you want out of this project going in. If you will only be happy with a deal, a big five publishing house and you know, trying to make it to the NYT bestsellers, that's not all those things, that's fine. But you got to know that that's what you want. If you don't want that, or you, that isn't as important to you, you just really want to get it out there in some way, that's fine. But that's very different than only being happy if it gets, you know, at the top of Penguin or Random House or something like that, right? So, you know, it, it, I think it's one of those things that we have to think about when you, we write as to what is what do we expect out of this? What do we want? Do we care if we only sell 2,000 copies? We'll be okay with that. Because if you if you are, well, that gives you an entirely different perspective on how you're going to approach agents or maybe not agents. Maybe you're going to go with an indie publisher that doesn't use agents or there's all kinds of things you can do. But right. You and and there's like, you know, sometimes like, and, and I see this in my, a lot of the grad school reading that we're doing, but sometimes you can go with an indie publisher and that, and that is the, the, the trick, right? Like that's the thing that catapults you to that place that you're, you're hoping for. So that's the, like, there are a couple of things that I, I always suggest to people is that, that you keep, you keep, you know, like one, you know, I have authors that are working on their screenplays for their books because you just don't know how your success is going to come. And some people's success is just writing the book and, and putting it online. And that's totally fine. You have to know what you want out of your projects, right? Like, as you're saying, um, and so like, I know a couple of um, writers, a couple of uh writers that are working on, they have different projects. They've done a lot of self-publishing, but they, they choose one project that they're going to, they're going to take all the way. They're trying to get through the tradition to the traditional marketplace with, and they're, they're slotting that book for that purpose. And, and then there are others who try to do that, but then they get impatient and they're like, I'm just going to put it out there and send in the next one. Um, and I think it's true that you kind of just have to know, like, what do you most want? Like, I know one woman that I worked with, uh, at a conference, I think I could have sold her book and there was an editor that was interested in it, but she, I think she was daunted by the editorial process and she was 80 and she was like, I just want to get my book out there. And I was like, oh, that me giving you all that advice was basically like me saying, I want this book and I'm going to try and sell it, you know? And so I think, um, I think it really is true. You kind of have to know what you want and then you have to kind of stick with it. The traditional publishing, uh, you know, attract is slow, you know, um, but if everything's kind of where it needs to be and you've really aligned yourself with the industry and you've gone through the revisions and you're, you're really at a place where, you know, you think it, you know, it's ready, then, um, then I would just, I would stay the course until you just can't anymore. And I mean, I've, I've worked with people in, in that, you know, that are basically kind of doing that same thing. They're getting to the end of trying to get a publisher and now they're ready to kind of think about an indie publisher. Um, so I do really think it has to do with what you want for yourself and using your intuition too, you know, like what, um, because sometimes, you know, a viral article is what gets you published. The number of books that we've read in grad, grad school were, were signed and, uh, signed by agents after they wrote a viral article that got looked at. So yeah. you just don't know how it's going to come, but you just got to keep kind of like scratching all the different surfaces. I think, you know, I, I only have one more serious question for you. And because I, I don't want to get away from the fact, as I noted up front, you're, you're, you're a triple threat. And one of them is of course, as a, as an independent editor, um, I'm, I'm intimately familiar with your skills there because uh, full disclosure, you've edited my manuscript and I am still, um, in rewrite process on that manuscript. And I still refer to the very detailed notes and suggestions and thoughts and guides that you gave me all that time ago as I'm writing this. And I like to think what it was, it's, it's made me a much better writer 
the story, which if I ever do get it done, is going to be a much more complex and interesting piece because of it. So I don't want to forget that, you know, before we get out here that, that you know, I want people to understand um, that you are also an editor. And so the thing that I want to ask you, and you said, you said the words earlier, and I really want to make sure people understand this, because I've had people approach me and say, well, you talk to editors, I need an editor, you know, there's a developmental editor, there's copy editing, there's something in between. So tell me a little bit about your philosophy as an editor, the difference between a developmental edit and a line edit, that kind of thing for the, for the people who maybe are just thinking about it and, and maybe the importance, especially if you're thinking about going independent of having a professional editor look at your manuscript before you send it out, whether it's to agents or to just self publish Right. Um, so, yeah, so I would say that probably 95, maybe even more percent of what I do is developmental editing. So as I look at a project that comes into me, <clears throat> I will I'll, I will line edit as I go. Um, if 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 I'm kind of moving through the project and the project is fairly clean, I usually will line edit if I start to see a lot of the same types of errors or typos, I will just notate what they are and let the, the author kind of take care of those at some point. Or if I notice a lot of sentence structure problems, um, those are things I'll bring up in the editorial letter. I won't try to fix those unless it feels like everything is kind of moving along and they really are kind of in a fine tuned stage. I will get to those projects once in a while that are that kind of do have, um, the mechanics of the storytelling down and everything and really just are in the line editing phase and need heavy line editing and those are the most tricky ones for me because um because sometimes it's it's really like you're you're you know running up against sentence structure problems but most of what i see needs a full developmental edit so it, and and by that what that is to me for in my perspective is a full look at the project and uh, a look at everything from, you know, are the, is there, is there uniformity across the project with, in terms of um, like chapter length? Um, is there enough happening in every chapter as we move forward? Should some of the chapters be combined or, or eliminated? Are the, the story threads being followed? You know, are there, you know, like we talked about that Winchester Mystery House syndrome, you know, you know, are we being led somewhere that we don't then follow up with or tie up in the end? Um, so, and that's what I feel most of the projects that I see need. They actually need a comprehensive look at everything from the dialogue. How's the dialogue, you know, looking? Um, do I like all the characters? What are the, you know, is the characterization deep enough? Um, so, you know, when you look at the different sections in my book and the different um, topics, I'm basically looking at everything that crosses my mind. And usually what I do is I try and write those down. I note them as I go on the manuscript, but I also then kind of think about the manuscript for a few days after I read it and then get into the the head, the different headings, whether it's dialogue, characterization, plot, themes, you know, all these different ways that we look at projects. And, you know, writing, great writing is a combination of a lot of different aspects. It's not just that the prose is beautiful, right? Because I've I've seen those too, where the prose is beautiful, but there's no story, you know. So it's it's a combination of so many things. And so that's what, what a developmental editor looks at is looking at everything. And then the copy editor is really more focused on the line edits and they do bring up little inconsistencies here, but the inconsistencies should be um, not very big, very simple things to, to, um, you know, to, to work on. And, um, you know, like there, for example, the copy editor that worked on my book, you know, she, she noted places where I needed to do a little bit more research or needed to kind of develop something, but she, they, they were pretty much across the board. Okay. With the structure that I, you know, created for the book, you know, I put a lot of time and energy into thinking that out. So the copy editor, you know, you know, definitely would be looking at, you know, line edits more specifically and, you know, they, they aren't proofreaders, so they're not necessarily proofreading your work, although some, you know, we all do a little bit of that as we go as well. Um, 
So, you know, personally, I think people, you know, most writers need a developmental editor, somebody will, that will look at the entire project and call out every single thing that they see. That's what I try to do. Sometimes I'll get a project that is, is so raw and so in the development phase that it, it, it doesn't make sense to call out everything because there are certain basic things that need to happen first before we get to, uh, you know, some of the other deeper issues of a project. Um, but, you know, it's, I've worked with a number of authors over the course of about four manuscripts. So I can kind of, you know, I kind of know when I've given them enough, you know, because it's a pretty overwhelming process anyway, you know, so at some point you're kind of like, okay, I think this is enough for them to really, you know, make a huge leap in their project. And just to end on that question, that last question that you had about, um, you know, if somebody decides to go to an indie publisher, um, you want to make sure that they're going to do a professional proofread on your work. Um, that I've seen that occur where some people have gone to indie houses and um, editors and agents are not proofreaders. Um, although I did that for a living at one point in newspaper, um, it's it's not uh, it. We are not proofreaders, right? So that's not the service that we're providing. Though we may correct things as we go a little bit. So if you do decide to go to an indie publisher, you want to make sure that they are providing a proofreader um, because. If they don't, you want to make sure that you you have that done on your end. And I think even before going to um, an indie publisher, you would want to make sure you have a copy edit because you don't know exactly how much effort and time they're going to put into your manuscript or whether you're just going to put it out there. So that would be, you know, and I've seen both happen. So you'd want to just be a little careful on that side. Well, I will tell you, as someone who has been uh, writing professionally for uh, over three decades now, um, every piece of writing, whether it's five words or 500,000, could use an editor. <laughs> I've been an editor for a very long time too in the, in the news game and I can tell you, or sometimes I, I, I look at my own stuff from a few years ago, I'm like, oh God, oh, yeah. where was my editor on this for crying out loud? Right. <clears throat> well, I don't wanna keep you uh, too long, but I always like to end on, on one uh, question that I intend to be fun I hope it's fun. I mean, it's meant to be fun for you. It's uh, meant to be fun for the audience and listeners. I, uh, and, I've, and I've been changing. I've been making notes here as we've gone along because uh, um, short version, I always offer you, let's just say I had the opportunity, I had the power, the ability to put you together with any one of the following three people for a conversation, dinner, drinks, whatever you like. Um, <clears throat> which one of these people would you choose and why? And the, the three folks that I'm going to offer you, and like I said, I was changing them as we went along. I'm going, nah, 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 let me go this way. And like I say, I, I, I always wanted them to be a little spontaneous, so, so bear with me. Uh, I'm going to offer you the uh, great uh, film director and screenwriter, Oliver Stone, uh, the rockabilly, early rock pioneer, Wanda Jackson, or the, uh, his, the uh, incredible poet, writer, Maya, Maya Maya Angelou, one of those three, I could put you together with one of them. Who would you choose and why? Hmm, that is tough. Um, Good, it was meant to be. <laughs> you know, it's and for totally personal reasons, like in, I'm in grad school. And so right now my, uh, right now my classes are poetry and screenwriting. And I'm gonna be, uh, and I'm working on both and I'm, I'm getting a lot of positive reinforcement from my screenwriting teacher and I'm feeling like I'm lacking in my my poetry a little bit la we're lagging behind in the collection that I'm kind of creating. Um, I think, uh, gosh, you know, so th those would be the reasons that I would choose between one of those is like, which one do I want to get the most, you know, the most out of. Um, I think I think in a way, even though screen my screenplay is what I'm most excited about right now, um, I feel like I would I would maybe go toward Maya Angelou so I could you know learn more you know about the about poetry and um, I feel like with I feel like every writer should read poetry because it would it really helps with word choice and it really helps with you know, putting forward concepts that don't create, that don't need a lot of words. You know, you can say so much with a poem with um, so little. And so I feel like learning from somebody uh, like her would would just kind of help me with that. And, 
and help me with, you know, I, I really feel, and one of the reasons that I, I am going to grad school is because I, I feel like I need that literary leaning. Like I want my, my writing to lean a little bit more literary. And I feel like the avenue to get there is through poetry um, and the study of words and the, and, and knowing that there are a, are a number of other options out there other than the, the ones, you know, we tend to land on cliches or, mm-hmm. you know, try and say things with cliches that, you know, just to quickly give a sense of situations, but I'd, I'd like to, to spend more time. And I think poetry um, and learning poetry uh, it just helps to give you, um, it, it, it makes you work a little harder, you know, for, for your word choice and, for um, not relying on cliches and things like that. So I think I would go toward Maya. <laughs> well, you um, know, it, it, the, the, the beautiful thing about good poetry and, and you know, um, the best writing is very clean, right? And the best, the thing that I love about really accomplished mo- and mostly modern poets is they say a lot with a few fewer words and you know it is clean and it and it's imagery um you know uh it it, it inspires you know though that's the beauty of poetry it's meant to inspire and to, to give you um you know visions or, or or the pictures in your head in a very uh, finite number of words and so I, I completely understand what your what your perspective is there well, I'm. Um, I would, I, I'll just say I would love to go Oliver Stone because I, I would like to hit that big, you know, that big ticket screenplay thing. But uh, <laughs> sure, absolutely, <laughs> awesome. I mean, yeah, no kidding. Well, I I want to thank you again uh, for those of you who who haven't uh, uh, who haven't got it. Please go get a copy of Liz's book and you know the author's checklist and agent's guide to developing and editing your manuscript. Save yourself a lot of time and trouble. The one thing that we all know as writers in this day and age, the more you can do for yourself up front, the better chance you give yourself to get the success eventually that you're after. And these are the kinds of things, there's so many craft books out there, they really uh, overwhelm us. And most of them are about the craft of writing and those are all great. But if you really, before you send something to an agent, please check out something like this. It will save you a lot of heartache and misery. I guarantee you. Liz, thank you again. I really appreciate it. Uh, It's always wonderful to talk to you. Uh, Your insights are incredibly valuable, I'm sure, to everyone who will be watching this, to uh, who who will now be inspired to go take another look at their work in progress and go, okay, let me think about this a little bit. So uh, stay with me for just a minute. Everybody else, uh, thank you again. I'm Rich Eisen. Uh, Pleasure always to have you here on the open mic. Uh, join me again next week. I'll have a I'll have another author here to talk about their work. So uh, until then, uh, have a great day and stay safe. We're not out of this pandemic yet. So please stay safe, be smart, be kind. We'll talk to you next time.